Hello one and all and welcome back to another episode of The Library Is Open. You find me today sat on the toilet. Well, I say sat on the toilet, the seat's down. You can't see that so you're just going to have to take my word for it. Um, but I thought I'd try this angle in the bathroom. I've rigged up quite an impressive contraption with a bubble bath and an ashtray. Uh, to balance to get this angle and I kind of like the way this blind is just creeping in the corner It feels very sort of art house cinema, doesn't it? Anyway, how are we all doing? I hope you're very well. I'm I'm all right. I'm not doing too badly My hair would say otherwise, but you can't have everything in life. Can you? We're not all Christina Applegate um, Oh sidebar if you haven't seen um, Christina Applegate and Linda Cardellini in Dead to Me the second series of which is now on Netflix do yourself a favour, it's a brilliant, brilliant show. But that is about TV shows, and this is a book channel, a sh Chanel de book. I don't know why I bother with these, trying to put things in other languages, because I just mess up the tenses. But there we go. Um, and this week, this is quite an exciting one, because we're going to be talking about a book that um, could be a washerwoman. Um, folding things. <laughs> Just for something to do with my hands. I'm going to be talking about one that you, uh, one of you recommended to me. Um, I will always make a video about anything that anyone recommends me to read. Because I think, you know, if you've gone out of your way to uh, share something you've read and think I should read, then I think it's only right that I make a, a video about it. Obviously, don't take the mickey. Nobody, nobody recommend War and Peace or anything. But I did a thousand page book in a few weeks ago and... Uh, yeah, and no Proust either. Um, I'll get to them if and when I have to. But anyway, that's that's what neither of those are this. And this is Richard Yates's book, Revolutionary Road, which was um, one of the recommendations. And I spoke about it in one of my hauls as well, because I mentioned how much I enjoy the cover art, which I found out from reading the back is actually courtesy of the Advertising Archives, which actually makes sense. Um, in terms of, because I think I said at the time, it reminds me a lot of an advert, just that's purely the cover, the, the vintage edition. And this was first published in 1961 uh, by Richard Yates, who sadly passed away in 1992. Um, and um, before we get into what it's about, um, I just wanted to read uh, the, this sort of four-word quote in the book, which is Keats, Alas, when passion is both meek and wild. And I kind of love that when, um, you know, the quotes at the start of books, when it's it's actually quite easy to see why they picked that as the foreword. Because sometimes they'll put things, we'll put things in, no, I am not in the bath. A little slice of life there. Um, they'll put a quote there. <clears throat> I'm not even going to edit that out because I'm real. Um, often an author will put them in there and you're like, why? But, um, this one I get it. So, the story of this basically is, <clears throat> it's about a couple called Frank and April, the Wheelers, who moved to a place called Revolutionary Road, which is sort of outside New York, you know, the sort of country boroughs. So, it's sort of halfway between being real country and the actual city. And, um, Frank works for a company that sell computers, basically. And uh, April is um, a mother of two when we uh, sort of encounter them in the book, although we kind of go back in time to both their lives um, when they were single and also to uh, times earlier in their marriage and so on and so forth. And the main crux of the plot is their lives together in suburbia where they both have this like yearning to be extraordinary because the, they've got this awareness that they've become very sort of suburban and... Um, you know, um, I guess drunk on on a misunderstanding of the American dream, if you will, and they make a plan to leave it all behind and go and live in Paris, where um, where April will support um, them with a job, and and Frank can really sort of find himself. Um, Unfortunately, <clears throat> things don't quite go to plan, which is the crux of crux of the novel, which is separated into three parts. Um, sort of interspersed with their story, we meet their neighbours, including the Givings, 
with a couple called Mr. and Mrs. Givings. Um, the um, Mrs. Givings is a uh, realtor or real estate agent, um, as you would say, and she sort of sells them the house and also becomes uh, someone who hangs around them a lot because they have a son um, called John who is in the psychiatric hospital receiving treatment and she's got this idea that she wants him to mix with the couple because um, she thinks they get on. There's also the Campbells who are a family on what we would probably call an estate now on Revolutionary Hill where they're sort of looked down on as sort of like lesser lesser class people um, and they're yeah they're the best friends to the wheelers although there's there's ructions there in the relationships because uh, the, Miss Campbell is in love with April and has a sort of interesting backstory in, in and of himself about how he copes with issues of masculinity and what he wanted to do with his life and also class. Um, so this was really interesting one. It reminded me very much <clears throat> of the Mad Men era. Now, I'm a massive fan of Mad Men. It's not my favourite show because my favourite show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but it is a show that I do come back to frequently. That sort of <clears throat> Madison Avenue, 1950s, white picket fence, they sort of, they, where the two things kind of rub up against each other. Um, and I really really love that so it gave me a lot of that it was like watching a lost episode of watching reading a lost episode of mad men which is which is certainly no no insult to say um i have to say i sort of raced through it after the first chapter so the first chapter i wasn't really sure i'll be honest because the first chapter deals with uh, an amateur dramatic production of um the Petri a play called the petrified forest which is a kind of about a, a british writer who it's a real play turns out, um, who sort of drifts into a town and disturbs the deadbeat existence of the people that live there. And, you know, I think that's clearly been chosen as a sort of um, pre-allegory, if you will, for what's about to follow. And and the play is kind of a disaster. Uh, and I was like, I don't really see where this is going. But actually, once we got into the couple's um, drama, then I got it. That's when I started to. That's me moving my finger very quickly. Because <clears throat> it's ultimately, I think, I think you could very much say that this is a novel of the American nightmare, which is not uncommon. You know, the shades of American beauty, Mulholland Drive, not specifically, but in terms of tone, that very sort of idea that what happens when you attain or receive what you're supposed to want based on the promise of where you were brought up, be that in a class structure or um, a country, you know, that sort of famous, the American dream thing, two cars in every garage and so on and so forth. What happens when you attain that and it doesn't bring you the fulfillment? Um, and what happens when reality rubs up against this kind of pristine advertising um, fodder? picture of what life is supposed to be like so there's really interesting stuff with uh april as a character who is um you know she's the one who sort of spearheads this campaign to get them to move to paris which frank agrees to but he's sort of a victim constantly of his own um wanting to be himself but also painfully sort of unable to make that final break with the idea of what masculinity seems to require him to do and what his sort of i guess legacy is there's a plot line about his father and their sort of relationship and how it, i mean it's not spoken explicitly about but it's like he ends up working for the company his dad once worked for and um, he tells his dad that he used his dad's name to get the job, but he didn't actually use his dad's name to get the job, which shows this kind of really weird conflicted side where he wants to break away from that, but he breaks away a little bit, but he can't quite push through because something's pulling back on him. It feels it, it's stifling at times, the atmosphere where you sort of, you get the image of being in this sort of 50s formica kitchen. And like looking around and feeling like just because something's in like pastels or bright colours or has the latest innovations doesn't make it any less of a prison, I guess. 
or you know um, a I guess somewhere that you're forced to reside through obligation to what we don't know for whom we don't know um, interesting part of the neighbours as well so there's the sort of suggestion that they're very you know um much not the same class as the wheelers although we did get a little bit of backstory about shep who is the is mr campbell and what his origins were and how he had this idea of how he should rebel against his quite middle to upper class background and you know he did that through joining the forces and then um you know sort of turning his back on this idea of um becoming a liberal or an intellectual and so on and so on and so forth which he then comes to regret and I thought in a way that's sort of like it's like while the American dream propagates itself constantly the antithesis to the American dream or the flip side of that or if you want to say the punk version of that is no less of a dream in the sense that neither of them really have foundation at all so he tries to defy it and go for the anti-dream and still finds it unsatisfying and it's like you know what do you do when you're constantly wherever you go just pushing up against these barriers that are objectively about choices that you made in life but did you really have full agency to make those choices or have you ended up a victim of both circumstance and tradition you know i think tradition and expectation are two of the biggest you know, they're two of the walls in, in the prison of everyone's life, you know, and it's whether you can escape them or whether you just have to wallpaper over them, you know. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not going to spoil the ending of this. Let, let's suffice it to say that it's, um, it doesn't end well, let's just say. And I'd be, I'd be really interested to know, actually. It'd be so interesting to talk to uh, Richard Yates because, obviously... Well, I'm comparing this to Mad Men, which, you know, very much satirised that sort of post-war boom, which, I mean, come on, let's face it, are we not seeing that? Are we not seeing that currently, you know, in the UK and the US? This weird idea um, of, you know, this sort of post-war golden blitz spirit, after maths thing of this invented time that doesn't really exist we're seeing that now which is why we keep or rather the government and you know people online keep harkening back to this idea of you know the war and what we were able to achieve you know as if it was just some amazing party where everyone was just look at my finger um you know where everybody was just um having a great time full of community spirit and you know, um, Mad Men does that really well as well in terms of looking at what, what is the flip side of that? What does that look like in reality? Because um, often it's a very carefully constructed and fabricated, um, well, construction, I guess, that's purely for the camera, but like what happens when the camera's off. So I'd be really interested to see when he was doing this because Mad Men's quite a modern series looking back retrospectively, whereas when this was published, this is literally that era that Yates is writing about. Um, and I'd be interested to see to which level any of the characters were inspired by people that he knew or cultures that he was aware of and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, there's that. But I'm I'm really glad actually I got over that first chapter and 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 committed to it. Um, commit because I suppose the weird thing is about uh, and it's something I criticised Noah Hawley for in Before the Fall, which is kind of true here, but you notice it less because well, of various reasons. Um, but the characters still feel at one remove which i think is probably intentional so you sort of get to know them but it's almost like you're talking to a friend of a friend because there's nobody you particularly empathize with because 
the language doesn't really allow you to do that and that's not a criticism of the writing because I think that's perfectly valid and I think there's probably a reason for that because I think Richard Yates is probably saying here there is no one to sympathise with because there is no one to demonise because no one's the instigator of their own American tragedy you know I mean horrific things happen to all of them and the scenes are very well written but you're more an objective observer than, than like a mate who's rooting for a character um, and, and, and I think that comes across in the cynicism that you feel as well because even when something seems to start to go right I often find myself reading through and going something's going to go wrong in a minute or you know, there's going to be a disappointment that's going to arise, or um, a crescendo will be reached and then just peter out. Because it's often not, in this book, it's not really about massive dramatic moments that then have a huge aftermath. It's more the sort of small, everyday suburban tragedies whereby, you know, there's this up, 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 and then slowly comes down as you know, um, this is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but with a whimper. But a whimper can be as painful as a bang. Sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? But, um, but yeah, so I think that's intentional and it, and it feels very much like a sort of parable for living against falsehood, not being seduced by the idea of what's proper and right, but trying to live truthfully and honestly within the constraints of your situation. Yeah, I think. Be interested to know what you thought. Um, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. I feel like, although, you know, he's in disgrace, I feel that, you know, if I was to watch this in a film, it, uh, Frank would be played by a young Kevin Spacey or something, and um, that would fit. But then again, I don't know if I'm just pulling that in with America excuse me, American beauty and sort of suburban gothic. But um would recommend. Um, he's quite a prolific author. It's the first one I've read by Yates, actually. Um, but I may check out more of his work later. Um, because I think, as a writer, he does um, interesting things with very little. Like, the text in itself is not complex uh, linguistically, which is not to say it's not skillful, but it's very readable. Well, you still get the idea that you're sort of ploughing through, working through serious um, or potentially revelatory, like, social topics. So, you know, kudos. Who doesn't want that lightness of touch? You know, we can't always be ploughing through treacle. I would imagine ploughing through treacle. That's made me feel ill, that. I don't like feeling sticky. Um, it's one of my least favourite things. But anyway, so that's Revolutionary Road. Great recommendation. Very glad I read it, and I'm really, um, really looking forward. Oh, Tennessee Williams says um, it was a masterpiece, you know. Actually, it would complement Tennessee Williams really, really well. Sort of thinking of Blanche Dubois, sort of constantly putting on airs and, and, and the, the ideas of gentility of the Old South. Um, yeah. We're all wearing costumes, aren't we? I think that's, I think that's what it's about. So yeah, and that's slightly downbeat. Now, thank you for that recommendation, and uh, do please check out Revolutionary Road, and if you do, comment below what you thought about it. Um, I'm gonna go and watch some more Mad Men, actually, because I've nearly finished Dead, Dead to Me, and I, um, I would like to watch some vintage advertising drama. If you haven't watched Mad Men, by the way, uh, that, that's another great recommendation. It's a fabulous show. A fabulous show that deals with misogyny and, you know, the dark side of the white picket fence. The dark side of the white picket fence. Doesn't that sound like a novel by Stephen King? Um, anyway. Well, it's not Stephen. I'm having it, so there you go. Put the plug in the bath out of the bath and watch Mad Men. Um, all right, my darlings, thank you for joining me again on this this uh, very special episode. They're all very special. There's nothing particularly special about this, apart from the fact that I've got hair like James Dean and I'm sat on the toilet. Again, the lid is closed. Keep your recommendations coming. I will always do dedicated videos for anything you recommend that I then purchase. And uh, in the meantime, uh, any other thoughts, comments, questions, reads, keep them clean. 
uh, drop below in the comments. Don't forget to like, and if you're not subscribed, please do, because I'm dead nice, and, um, you know, I have low self-esteem, so I could do with, I could do with the boost. Um, oh, also follow me on uh, my social media platforms, at StuArt, A-R-T in capitals, Crowther on Twitter, and at CreepingMyasma on um, the Insta. I'll link those in the pinned comment below. So until next time, wipe off that library card, wipe it double, it's still a pandemic on no matter what anyone says, uh, put it somewhere safe and keep those pages turning until I welcome you once again to the library. Much love and take care. Mwah.